This morning, we return once again to the book of Proverbs. We find ourselves today carefully considering the words of the wise in Proverbs 22, 16 to 24, 22. Our guest speaker is Professor Michelle Knight. Michelle is in her third year of PhD work in biblical and theological studies with an Old Testament focus at Wheaton College. Now, as important as it is for you to know that, it is equally important for you to know that Michelle is one of us. Just a few years ago, she was sitting where you are sitting. Michelle did her Master of Divinity at TED's graduating in 2013. Michelle has taught elementary Hebrew for us, her final year here, and she is currently our instructor for the Hebrew review course that we offer every summer. She's here today not to teach Hebrew, but to open the word of God to our community. And so we welcome you, Michelle. The text of Proverbs 22 calls us this morning to incline our ear and to hear the words of the wise. And so that is what we will do as we enter into worship together. Hear the words of Daniel's prayer. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Gracious Father, we offer up to you this morning our praise and adoration because you are a great and glorious God. You have done for us through the work of Christ what we could not do for ourselves. We were lost, and you have saved us. You have redeemed us. Through your spirit, you sustain us, and through your word, you instruct us. We worship you this day with joy and gratitude because of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Proverbs 23, verses 15 to 19, as well as Proverbs 24, verses 13 and 14. Please turn your Bibles if you want to follow along. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Again, it's Proverbs 23, 15 to 19, then Proverbs 24, verses 13 and 14. Starting in Proverbs 23, verse 15. My son, if your heart is wise, then my heart will be glad indeed. My inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Listen, my son, and be wise, and set your heart on the right path. Now Proverbs 24, verses 13 and 14. Eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know also that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I wasn't <laughs> expecting a response. Thank you. Um, it's a delight to be here. Uh, as Dr. McGarry said, I am one of you. Um, this is a place that's very near and dear to me. Uh, a dear friend of mine defended his dissertation last week, and I was able to be here on campus, and I was almost overwhelmed with emotion when I'd come back. Um, not because there's anything special about these four walls. All of us are kind of familiar with the campus. We know some walls are more special than others. Um, but there are people here who have loved me and cherished me and train me up in the way I should go. There are people here who've worked hard to help me understand how scripture works, to hear, to listen to the voice of God, to heed his wisdom. Um, and so it's only fitting that today that's exactly what we're talking about. This place is that to me. 
Um, and so I'm excited to be able to talk about those sorts of things here again. So let's do it. Uh, to speak on Proverbs is a little funny for me. I have to admit that when I read Proverbs, it takes a little extra energy because I am a Judges scholar. Um, my work in Judges is straightforward and fabulously tidy. Um, Judges is full of vital sequences for the Hebrew speakers among you. It's full of really tidy narrative patterns. It's very easy to anticipate. It's cyclical. I know what's coming next. Proverbs is terrifying. I never know what's coming next. <laughs> and yet somehow, in wandering about in it, it feels more comfortable every day because it almost seems as if Proverbs teaches us how to read itself. The wisdom that it promises to us is actually required to understand what it's saying. Spiritual formation happens when we read all of scripture, but it's right on the surface when we read Proverbs. It's really easy to see. And I'm excited to do that today. The title of my sermon um, is, What is Sweeter Than Honey? This little question is actually from Judges. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> This little question begins the response of the rabble-rousing companions of Samson. Samson and the boys had placed a little wager about whether or not the townsmen could come up with the answer to his clever riddle. Using a bit of brute force and coercion, the companions come up with the answer, and their answer in Jeopardy style, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? I couldn't stop thinking about Samson the entire time I was working in this text. He comes to us at the tail end of Judges, representing all of the worst of the people of Israel balled up in one aggressive, lustful, unfaithful judge. By God's grace and empowerment, he began to rescue Israel from the Philistines. But his story exemplifies what eventually becomes the themes of the Judges period. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Samson's actually the first person in the book who's said to just do whatever's right in his own eyes. He was a lost, foolish, prodigal son whose parents couldn't figure out how to deal with his antics, whose relations were constantly put in danger because of his terrible friends and quick temper. And yet from birth, he was set apart for the service of God. Faced with the decision of life or death, faithfulness or indifference, wisdom or folly, faced with the very same two ways that Proverbs has presented to us over and over. Samson forged his own way. Samson's a case study in foolish indulgence. In the passage that was so carefully read for you just a moment ago, the sage says the following, my son, eat honey. You can see why Samson came to mind. My son, eat honey, for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul, and if you find it, there will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. I wish I could pose the question to Samson once more. Samson, really, what's sweeter than honey? What is sweeter than indulging yourself in the appetites of the moment, Samson? There's something far sweeter Chances are most of us need that same question posed to us. Using a powerful simile, the sage chooses the most effective sweetener of the ancient world to describe the all-surpassing sweetness of wisdom, honey. Remember, the promised land was described as flowing with milk and honey. This delectable treat is not only a delicacy, a good thing, valuable, honey's delicious. It's pleasurable, it's enjoyable. And so is wisdom. As we work through this passage today, I think we'll be surprised to find that it's actually really thematically coherent. Um, maybe this isn't a surprise to some of you, um, but when we talk about Proverbs, we don't expect that necessarily. Um, especially this passage, we tend to talk about it in concert with certain Egyptian writings. Um, and so those tend to be the way that, kind of, that dictates our conversation of the passage. We expect it to be kind of a collection of sayings, which it certainly is. Um, but I argue that the sage, that's how I'm going to refer to the guy who put this together, however we want to talk about that, the sage. 
Whoever did so seemed to group these thoughts in ways that actually make a lot of sense. So I'm going to suggest this. This passage is saturated with vocabulary, examples, and metaphors that deal with appetite. Everyone who comes to the book of Proverbs yearns for the good life, hungers for comfort and prosperity, desires a life of happiness and peace. And in this section, the sage sets out to convince us that to desire any of those things for its own sake is the beginning of a foolhardy path. Only when one craves, hungers, yearns for wisdom founded on the fear of the Lord will he actually experience the good life. That this is the goal of the sage is obvious in verses 17 through 21. Again, I'm actually going to kind of follow with the text pretty closely, so feel free to keep your Bible or your tablet or whatever open. All right, so let's look at 17 through 21. I'm going to read these to you briefly. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them, if all of them are ready on your lips, that you may trust to be in the Lord and that I have made them known to you today, even to you. Have I not written for you formally or 30 sayings of counsel and knowledge to make you know what is right and honest, that you may give a true answer to those who sent you? Apply your heart to my knowledge, he says. Apply your heart to my knowledge. For all the times the parental voice in Proverbs pleads with the son to hear and to listen and obey, this is the very first time we've been invited to apply to heart or take to heart the imparted knowledge. As we'll see, the language of heart litters the section. The sage here is concerned with our inner life. Did you notice the shift in verbal forms too? Sorry, Hebrew teacher. The shift in verbal forms is really kind of glaring, actually. Rather than indicative clauses or the kind of straightforward statements we tend to have in the Solomonic collections, where we talk about the way that things are, the way the world works, when we look through the lens of the fear of God, when we, from a God-fearing perspective, analyze reality, what does it look like? That tends to make up the Solomonic collections. In contrast, here, we have imperatives. This section faces us directly, square in the face, and addresses us with admonitions. This change in verbal form gives the text a new intensity. One of the literary features of this style of a proverb is that most of these sayings will also include what scholars call motivational clauses, motive clauses, like the one we see here in verse 18. In fact, in the verses that follow, the sage is going to spend all of his energy attempting to motivate us toward putting our faith in God by realigning the desires of our heart. He will mount an argument to convince us that just as nothing is sweeter than honey, so is nothing more desirous than wisdom. So let's jump down to 2222, which I would say is kind of the beginning of the next section. We encounter here a list of sayings that consists predominantly of prohibitions. Thou shalt not, for lack of a better word. There are a whole lot of do nots here, all in a row. Go ahead, skim those verses with me. As you do, notice that this is not a random list. The sage is addressing robbery, debts, the delicacies of fine eating, wealth, I think we can generalize to say we're talking about prosperity here, financial security. But not only are these certain ideas repeated throughout the section, but the text explicitly repeats itself three different times. I imagine a teacher along the way has told you to pay attention when the text repeats itself. Um, on the chance that hasn't happened, I'll say it now. When the text repeats itself, you should pay attention. In verse 22, 22, 22 that is, we have the statement, for the Lord will plead their cause or plead their case. We have the assertion that God is going to care for those who don't have others to care for them. Scroll down to the end. I'm just assuming you're on a tablet. Flip down the page uh, to 2311, where it says, he will please their cause against you. Twice the reader is warned that the Lord will actively protect the interests of the downtrodden. Twice, God promises to protect the weak, those who are easily taken advantage of. But look also at verse 28. Um, and this would be 22, 28. 
do not move the ancient landmark. But then flip over to 2310. Do not move an ancient landmark. We've got another frame. The land, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey was the most tangible and pivotal blessing that Yahweh had bestowed upon his people. God's redeeming work had always been about establishing a place in which Israel could rest in God's loving presence. This precious gift was divided and allotted according to families and marked out by ancient landmarks, the very ones mentioned here. Consider Deuteronomy 19.14. You shall not move your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set in the inheritance that you hold in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. This is so central to the well-functioning of Israel that to move a landmark in this way is one of the covenant curses in Deuteronomy 27. To mess with the tribal land allotments is simultaneously one of the most grievous sins for an Israelite to commit. They're messing with God's tangible, gracious gift and one of the easiest sins to commit. It's a hidden sin. It's a sin witnessed by God alone. We're talking about like walking up in a field where somebody's like that stone over there that's over there between the tree and kind of the shadow of the mountain. That's right there, the end of my territory. Nobody else is around, you can move that. Um, and this is something that potentially could have happened. But this is central, don't steal, don't do that. There's one more line that's repeated twice. Notice how the first pair we talked about framed the entire section. The most recent pair we talked about is a similar, smaller frame. Our final pair is situated very near the middle of the entire passage and adds one final layer to the section's chiastic arrangement. So now I'm looking at 23, verse 3. Notice that it says, do not desire his delicacies. And you only have to glance down three more verses to get the second time that that's said. Do not desire his delicacies. As the section progresses inward, remember we're talking about a chiasm. As the section progresses inward, it moves from admonitions about blatant robbery to the prohibition of stealthy theft, to an emotional desire, and finally, to a central disposition central both thematically and central in the passage. Look at verse 23, four. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. In these initial verses, the sage identifies the first of four appetites we'll address in this passage, an appetite for financial security. No one can serve two masters. You cannot love both God and money. The fear of financial insufficiency competes with the fear of the Lord. To toil after wealth, to prioritize prosperity, is to make room for moral compromise that promises to bring financial security of its own. Moral compromises like extending one's property to the detriment of the disadvantaged. Despite the reality that wisdom tends to promote prosperity, to toil after material wealth itself is misguided. It's not only idolatrous, but it's ineffective. Verse 5 assures us that when your eyes light on it, it's gone. Financial security that is not grounded first in the provision of our God is illusory. Hollow. Deceptive. One might say that it's a chasing after the wind. So let's look down further. We have another section here, another craving that the text talks about. Uh, let's start at 23.12. Apply your heart to instruction, the sage says, and your ears to words of knowledge. We've heard this. That sounds familiar. We're kind of back to where we started, didn't weren't we? We are applying to heart this instruction. So we have kind of a new beginning here. But look how it continues. Don't withhold discipline from a child. And then we have, my son, if your heart is wise, my heart will be glad. Let not your heart envy sinners. Continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Knowledge of God's ways is central to a well-functioning society, a family unit, a church. It's essential to the body of Christ. And yet right away in verses 13 through 14, this passage confronts our temptation to underestimate the value of that instruction. 
the value of an environment where imparting and receiving godly wisdom is made a priority. Verses 13 and 14 talk about discipline. Uh, if you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol, or the grave, or however we want to render that. We most frequently hear this verse in relation to physical discipline because of the mention of a rod in the text. But frankly, what this verse says about spanking children, I'm not qualified to say. I'm not an expert in biblical methods of discipline, nor a psychologist, nor even a parent. But I know the temptation to avoid confrontation to avoid calling out a dear friend, to avoid conflict in my family, to be scared to offend, I know the temptation to withhold discipline, to withhold instruction selfishly. I know what it is to value self-preservation over wise guidance. Whatever this text does allow or instruct in terms of corporeal punishment, in fact, seems to be second to the concerns for the text. Continue reading, look to verse 17. Let not your heart envy sinners. Continue the fear of the Lord all day. There will be a future for you. Those who he disciplined, those who are instructed well from a godly perspective are contrasted with those from whom discipline is withheld. Those who don't receive much wisdom are in danger of the grave. Their hope will be cut off. The wise woman not only heeds wisdom, but gives it freely. She values it enough to impart it to those around her. And look at the result. This passage talks about joy, exultation. Over and over, this is a warm and happy passage. We see it overflowing with the joy of a parent watching his or her son, his or her daughter, living life the way God intended. Friends, fear of the Lord, centering our lives squarely on living a life worthy of the calling we've been giving, participating in the great work of redemption God is playing out before our eyes, faithfully living under the lordship of Christ. Fear of the Lord is the cure to our cravings. How do we protect ourselves from the hunger for the life of the wayward, for the indulgent life, for the life of prosperity? How do we avoid envying sinners? Dear friends, we persist in the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. The parental voice from the beginning of Proverbs reemerges in these verses to plead with us to fear God, to desire him more than anything else. So in this text, we have found the second of four appetites, a craving for wisdom. In the heart of the book of Proverbs, couched between two Solomonic sections, the words of the wise push us to examine our hearts, to examine our desires, to desire our hunger and our thirst. And actually, thirst is exactly what we see in the verses ahead. Juxtaposed with the joy, exultation, and hope inspired by a son who chooses wisdom is a graphic description of the sorrow, strife, and folly that comes from a life lived in overindulgence. In verses 20 through 35, we find a description of a third dangerous appetite, drunkenness, and also gluttony is mentioned. Verse 20 says, don't be among drunkards, don't be among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, slumber will clothe them with rags. But the contrast between the joy of a wise life and the misery of an overindulgent one creates such a graphic image that the sage continues to compare the two. He doesn't stay on drink, he goes back to wisdom again. And so in verse 22, he pleads with the son to choose the lifestyle that will have the opposite effect. Listen to your father who gave you life. Truth you should buy. Do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Note the financial language we're getting here that recalls the theme of the earlier verses. There are other things you can invest in, other things you can buy. But the fixation on acquiring earthly wealth is more properly applied to the pursuit of wisdom. Let's go on. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Then he ends this part in verse 26 by saying, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. So against this joyful backdrop, the sage assesses indulgent drink. The life of a drunk suits the purposes of the unit brilliantly. The seductive pull of alcohol now, I say seductive for a reason. Did you notice the mention of a beautiful woman, of Lady Folly, that we got in those verses? The seductive pull of alcohol and the way it leads us astray is the perfect illustration, the perfect illustration of how a craving can become our master. In many ways, um, drunkenness is the stereotypical sin of excess. 
Let's be cautious. I would be overstating to suggest that gluttony and drunkenness in Proverbs are simply symbolic. That is purely not the case. The text is clear about the dangers of these goods. While a little wine is good for the stomach, Proverbs says that we've seen in our own lives, alcohol can ruin a family. Alcohol can and does destroy lives. This is so straightforward that the author of Proverbs uses a series of questions, questions to which we already know to answer to make his point. Look at verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Here, waking up in the morning with bruises and not knowing where you got them. Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. Whoever claims scripture was irrelevant and out of touch must have missed verses like these. I've never seen a more perfect description of a hangover in my life. See, the text takes this common knowledge and demonstrates how, rather than giving comfort and joy, alcohol bites the hand that grasps the bottle. The drunkard embraces its killer like a lover to his own downfall. And that's what we see in verses 31 through 35. Don't look at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. And then this, again, a great description of what we can visualize. Your eyes see strange things. Your heart utters perverse things. You'll be like one who lies in the midst of the sea, dangerously, one who lies on the top of a mask. Um, they struck me, you'll say, but I wasn't hurt. They beat me, but I didn't feel it. When shall I await? I must have another drink. The image of intoxication conveys powerfully how we embrace our vices. We hunger for that which destroys. We crave that which brings us harm. We say, indulge yourself. Treat yourself. You deserve it. Just charge it. Buy it. You've earned it. And Proverbs cries, please no. In the voice of a caring, seasoned parent, the text lovingly embraces each of us in our stubbornness like a mother clings to a child. Through these verses, our dear Lord whispers fervently, do not embrace a life of indulgence. Stop, think, cling to discernment. My sweet child, indulgence is the enemy of wisdom. Proverbs acknowledges that an unhealthy appetite for even the best of things perverts the greatest of God's gifts. The image of the vine in the Old Testament is one of prosperity, people. God's provision of vineyards is consistently portraying his desire for us to enjoy his creation. And yet, as one commentator has said, rather than taking the opportunity for grateful worship, humans often become idolatrous consumers instead. And in these moments, friends, our gods are our, our bellies, as Paul has said. Perhaps we have moments when we aren't convinced that wisdom and temperance and careful discernment is more pleasant than indulgence. Perhaps when we're being very honest, our desire for the self-destructive and foolish patterns against which Proverbs warns overwhelms our desire for wisdom, our desire to see the, way, the world the way that God does. And so, in 24.1, the sage repeats again, about, uh, again, his warning about the desires of our heart. Be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their hearts devise violence and their lips talk of trouble. Note how the text now addresses the heart of the evil man. We've been talking about that in our life. Now we're looking at his motivations. Notice also the move from the negative statements in verses one and two to the positive ones here in three through five. By wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. I'm not entirely sure that this will show in your particular translation, but note how all of these adverbial phrases, by wisdom, by understanding, by knowledge, are emphasized. While the evil men of verse 1 are using violence and devious thoughts as their instruments, the sage encourages us to take up wisdom, which we can wield far more effectively. And for what? To build a house, to wage war, to be strong? This final section addresses a fourth appetite, a stomach for success. Notice how the devising sinner appears again down in verse 9. 
This section contrasts appropriate, God-honoring, wise planning with something divisive, self-serving, and sinful. The line between God-honoring shrewd decision-making and shameful self-interested plotting is a really fine line indeed. We are uniquely skilled in our attempts to convince ourselves that our intentions and actions are pious. And so the sage provides a list of prohibitions, a list of do nots, to help us gauge just how pious is our attitude as we try to make our rise in the world. We see a similar sentiment in verses 15 through 22. Lie not in wait as a wicked man against the dwelling of the righteous. Do no violence to his home. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Fret not yourself because of evildoers, and be not envious of the wicked. Third time we've been told that. Third time. For the evil man has no future. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. The ways of wickedness, the ways of the sinner, the ways um, of those who strive for success, for the sake of success and not for promoting the ways of God. Those ways have a built-in expiration date. One needn't worry about those plots. The universe made, monitored, and managed by the Most High will not allow the enduring prosperity of the wicked. Despite all appearance to the contrary, this is why the riches of the wealthy man are deceptive. Why one cannot envy the evil man. There's no sense in it. We do it. Occasionally, we think that that way of life might actually work better. But we can't. Let's continue. He ends this section by saying, My son, fear the Lord and the King, and do not join with those who do otherwise, for disaster will arise suddenly from them. And who knows the ruin that will come from them both? In this passage about futile schemes, um, evil ways of planning and plotting, we kind of get a zinger here at the end. The Lord God of the universe and the one figure he's authorized on earth to execute his judgments, those are not a pair to trifle with. So in a bunch of sayings that say, come now, this sort of, this sort of sinful um, planning and managing and scheming It not only doesn't work, but it's particularly futile when you're up against the king and up against the Lord of Israel. With this zinger, the sage ends his exhortations against seeming. But you might have noticed, we skipped over the very most important part of this chapter. In the midst of these contrasts, the sage says the following words. And here I'm going to jump back to 13 and 14. So we're in chapter 24, 13 and 14. I know we've been jumping around. You guys have been great about it. I've heard pages flipping, thank you. So 13, my son, eat honey, for it is good. And the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Here, the sage picks up vocabulary from the section on gluttony and drinking above. In the midst of, or in the mind of the ancient, nothing, nothing sweeter than honey. Nothing sweeter than honey. And the sage implores us to understand that to our souls, nothing is more pleasant than wisdom. Friends, Proverbs exhorts us over and over again to choose the path of wisdom. But in this section, the sage warns us that a sense of duty or obligation to God's paths may not be enough. That obligation will always be in competition with our thirsts, our desires, our cravings, our hunger. Samson's Nazarite upbringing was no match for the delight of his eyes. Everything was pleasing to Samson's eyes all the time, Samson's eyes. But this Nazarite upbringing was nothing. It didn't matter that he was dedicated from birth for the purposes of God. It couldn't protect him from the fleeting desire of his stomach. Guys, we get what we crave. We have to crave the right things. Eat honey. 
God's instruction is not too difficult for us. It isn't beyond our reach. It isn't something ethereal and heavenly, so hard to conceive of or touch that we never can do it. This word is close. It's on our lips and on our hearts. And the Lord, the God of creation, has promised to enable us to do these things. And so in the time remaining this morning, we're gonna have an opportunity to cry out to him, to pray that he will enrich in us um, an overwhelming desire to know him better, to do things in this world the way he would have us do them, to participate in his grand redemptive work, to be a part of what he is doing, and to see the world with the eyes that he sees it. I'm going to pray for us that we can seek wisdom in that way. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we come to you this morning so thankful that you saw fit to speak to us so generously, that you instructed us in so many ways at so many times in just the way we needed you to, so that we could live a life according to the calling that we have received. But Father, we live in a world of excess, a world of hungers, a world that glorifies cravings. Father, teach us that the only desire of our hearts is you. Father, I pray that we would be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Father, I pray that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. God, I pray that you would strengthen us with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience and joy. We give you thanks for you've qualified us to share in this inheritance, the inheritance of the saints in light. Father, you have delivered us from darkness and transfer, uh, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, your beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so, Father, with that truth, teach us to cherish the life in your way. Teach us to eat honey, for it is good. We lift this up in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and receive the benediction. May you, being rooted and established in God's love, have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.